Words at War. On Words at War tonight, we tell you of an actual event which took place in December 1942. Tonight, the story of the incredible adventures of the Coast Guard Reserve Boat 3070. Coast Guard Reserve 3070. Hooligans Navy, that's what it is. That boat belongs to Hooligans Navy. Huh? What's that? Hey, how long you been at sea, Pete, that you ain't never heard of Hooligans Navy? Never mind getting fancy. Just tell me what it is, huh? It's them coastal picket boys. You know, fishermen, yachtsmen, blue water sailors, guys like that. Things has been pretty hot up and down the East Coast, and the Navy sends out a call. So now these guys go charging up and down the coast in their yachts, sea tubs, and spit kits looking for German subs. They're a special branch of the Coast Guard. Coastal pickets, they call themselves. But the rest of us, they're just hooligans Navy. You know, no class. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. This CGR 3070 can't be no more than 10 feet, huh? <laughs> Hooligan Junior, huh? <laughs> a little 10 foot spit kid. <laughs> she ain't no 10 foot spit kid. She's a 57 foot yo, huh? Oh, yo. Where'd you come from? Been standing here listening. 57 foot yo, that's what she is. Yeah? You know a lot about her, don't you? Huh? Yeah, she's my boat. I'm a member of the crew. Oh, a Hooligan, huh? Yep. Your ship ain't very big, is she? Nope. Has she uh, seen much action? Uh, like uh, submarines, things like that? Nope. What's the matter? Don't even you like her? Ain't she no good? Good. Let me tell you something, Mac. The 3070 is probably the neatest, sweetest little sailing craft that ever kicked up a fantail in the wind. And she's the prettiest, slimmest, snootiest, trimmest little dame that ever walked the water. She can roll with a punch like Lewis, heave to like an angel, and run a breeze as light and hot as a kiss. Matter of fact, she's the darndest, finest, fanciest son of a gunboat in the whole pockmarked hoo in the Navy. You got a butt? Oh, uh, sure. Say, uh, your ship is good, like you say. Uh, what's she doing laying up here on the dock? Why ain't she out winning the war? It's because she's being fixed, that's why. Just come back after being pushed all over the Atlantic by hurricanes and blizzards. Get a match? Yeah. Pushed all over the Atlantic, huh? For how long? Thanks. 21 days. How come? You got lost. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, brings you an account of one of the greatest searches in American naval history. The epic story of a gallant little coastal picket boat written by Lieutenant Lawrence Thompson. The Navy hunts the CGR 3070. Well, uh, after you got lost, what happened? Didn't they find you? I'm sure they did. Lots of times. Didn't take. Not for three weeks it didn't take. I remember the day we shoved off for this patrol, right after Thanksgiving it was. The weather was pretty nasty, cold and gray and kind of ominous. But we sent the 3070, a 57-foot yawl, out on the sea. Log of Commander Eastern Sea Frontier. Entry. At 1300 o'clock, Army Bomber 35998 reported unable takeoff for prescribed duty. Engine trouble. Another escort provided outgoing merchant ships. At 1800, message received from CGR 3070. Arrived at station 50 miles off Greenport, Long Island. Thirty-seventy under full sail was picking away easy like through the water. There's nine of us aboard, counting the skipper, me and Smitty and Jobby and George, and and there was Watson and Joe Chote. He was the exec officer. There was nine of us all together. Now Smitty and me was topside on watch. It was night, 
We couldn't see so good, so he was watching with our ears, kind of. Uh, German submarines, that is. I said to Smitty, Boy, I'd like to see a submarine. I, I sure would like to see one. Well, I need to see a submarine like I need a ring in the nose. I wonder what we'd do if we seen one. Yeah, that's easy. We'd drown him. Yeah? How? Sure. We creep up on him. You see, that's where a sailboat's got it all over a destroyer or a PC. No motors making noises. We creep up on him, see? Yeah, well, then what? You can't shoot him. No guns. Quiet, will you? I'm telling you. We creep up till we got even. And then we come about real quiet. We come about till we are right alongside, and then. Yeah. And then we all take turns spitting down a periscope, see? We drown him. I'm dying from laughing. Well, what'd you ask me for? You know what we do. We radio ashore and they send out bombers and destroyers, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, what's the matter then? You don't like your job? Sure, I like it. It's just that I'd like some action, that's all. Action? Yeah? What size? Oh, cut it out, Smitty. You know what I mean. It's okay, but I'd hey, rather... Hey, shush, shush. Huh? I heard something. Sub? Yeah, wait a minute. No. No, I guess not. Oh, wait. I heard it, too. Right over there. Submarine! Wait. Surfacing! Two points off, port bow! Submarine! Hey, what you see it, Bill? Wait, hey, hey, wait a minute, it's gone. Must have submerged. No, 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 there it is, there. Where, where, where? Okay, boys, go on back to sleep. Uh, what do you mean? Look, Sonny, don't you know the difference between a submarine and a whale? <laughs> and what's more, it's a lady whale with children. <laughs> pretty much how time went. We patrolled our station, watched for subs, and froze. A sailboat out in the Atlantic is no place to be in December. We'd uh, stepped a stove fast to the bulkhead between the cabin and galley, but one little pot-bellied stove doesn't help much when it comes to keeping nine men warm. Then the sea began to build up and started running pretty high. Anybody who's been juggled around a sailboat by heavy seas knows what I mean. We got seasick. One by one, we got good and seasick. By the last day of our patrol, we were real ready to set sail for home. And we, most of us, kept pretty near the radio waiting for the message calling us in. Sort of guess how our spirits shot up when that message came. Calling CGR 3070 3070 3070. This is Nan Mike Yoke, Nan Mike Yoke, Nan Mike Yoke. Your patrol is prolonged. I say again, your patrol is prolonged. You are ordered to proceed eight miles easterly course to investigate possible submarine contact. Proceed eight miles easterly course to investigate possible submarine contact. Over and out. My spirit shot up all right, like a lead balloon they shot up. We turned the 3070 about and headed out to sea again. The weather really was kicking up now. The job is the wheels having a hard time meeting the seas head on. And then came another message over the radio phone. A storm warning it was. It said the wind might build up to 30 knots. 30 knots. Hey. Hey, hey, job, eh? What's the present wind velocity? About 35 to 40. <laughs> Maybe we should send storm warnings ashore. And then things got worse and worse, and finally the message we'd been waiting for came. This is Nan Mike Yoke. Nan Mike Yoke. Nan Mike Yoke. All coastal picket boats ordered ashore. All coastal picket boats head for shore. This is an order. Head for shore. Head for shore. Ordered ashore. Good order, except we couldn't follow it. And now we were bouncing through rollers and chop like a ping-pong ball. And we figured we'd have a better chance if we kept sailing hope, too, instead of beating back to the base off wind. Right then, we didn't care to go no place. We just wanted to stay where we was, alive. And then it happened. It was off watch. Joe and Smitty and a couple others and me. And George was there, too. I remember that because he said... Well, there's one thing. These no-Nazi-Summit folk, it snows up and weather like this. 
I bleed for him. These poor Nazi subs, all safe and snug downstairs while we're up here jumping around like a pogo stick. Listen, the trouble with you guys, you don't know what trouble is. Huh? Why, this isn't anything. A little gale, seas running a little high, and of course we might capsize at any minute, Oh, but... fine, Joe, fine. I'm glad you're taking it all so happy. But just tell me this. What happens to us if we capsize? Just what happens? The best thing that could happen to a sailor, Smitty. Yeah? What's that? A fine Navy funeral with full military honors. Oh, but... Hey! Hey, what's that? And so we got it. It was like being hit in the side of the head by a cannonball. All of us were swept all over the cabin like dice in a box. All the furniture broke loose. The heavy center table skidded after Joe and socked him on the head, and, and Watson and the cast iron stove met in the same corner. Only Watson got there first, and the stove landed on top of him. Both guys were hurt bad, but we didn't know it at the time. Soon as we could, we scrambled up the deck. We were sure Chubby had been washed overboard, but he wasn't. He was hanging to the wheel, gulping, kind of, and, and pointing off to lure. Hey, look. Look there. Yeah, I see it. There goes our lifeboat. Yeah, look at that. It even took its paddles. Oars. Well, that's what I mean, oars. It even took its oars. After a while, we realized the 3070 wasn't going to sink, so... We kind of collected ourselves a bit. Our little boat was hurt bad. Her mizzenmast had snapped off. The shackle had carried away at the head of the storm trysail. What was left of the other sails was rags and tatters. What had happened was we got caught in the trough of a couple of breakers, and the coming breaker had swamped us like a beach swell cracking up a toy boat. The 3070 was hurt bad. But somehow she was still sailing. We were still going. We won't be going for long unless you guys get your tails up and start bailing. We bailed. We hauled pans from out the galley, and for two solid hours we bailed. And all the time, Smitty kept worrying us with his talk about seams. The seams is open. They can't be. We've been drowned. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm saying it ain't natural for all this water to be down here. The seams is open. And I'm saying they can't be. Okay. Okay. We kept on bailing, except for Watson and Joe. Watson's ribs had been smashed when the stove fell on him, and Joe had got a big gash on the head from the center table. We lashed them both in their bunks. The ship was rolling so hard they had to be lashed in. And Joe lay there holding a towel to his head. We watched the blood sop through the towel away coffee soaks up a lump of sugar. There was nothing we could do about it. We felt bad about not being able to do anything. We tried to cheer him up. We told them we're sure to be rescued before dark. Sure, it's one now. Why, they'll pick us up by five. Uh, sure, we're in a good place to be picked up. Yeah, I, I bet you a million bucks that the, the whole Navy gets here by three. It got darker and darker. Finally, we couldn't even see the bowsprit. Got cold out, real cold. Snow drove hard in our faces like frozen rain. We kept on telling Watson and Joe of how he was going to be picked up. Well, lots of rescues is done in the dark. Why, listen. The Navy's got spotlights can pick a man out ten miles off. hundred miles, maybe. Ha! We're, we're a cinch. That night... We stood watches only an hour long. As the fellas came below, freezing cold and soaking wet in the spray, they'd be so wore out they just fell on the bunks, or on the cabin deck, boots and all. Wherever they lay, we'd cover them up with soaking wet blankets and hope the heat from their own bodies would dry them out. And it was a long night, cold, long and cold and black as a pocket. And as it dragged on, we stopped talking about being picked up. Log of Commander, Eastern Sea Frontier. December 3rd. Entry. Violent storm raging along Atlantic seaboard. All shipping endangered. 
Distress signals from Coast Guard Reserve 3070 intercepted. Position approximately 20 miles off no man's land. At 1300 o'clock, Army Bomber 21760 reported CGR 3070, 35 miles east of former position at 2200. Navy PBY 425 reports 3070 being steadily blown out to sea. Orders given for all craft to be on lookout for 57 foot yawl. Big army bomber circled around us, flew off, and didn't come back. Maybe it came. We wasn't there. We was being blown to the terrible clip through the sea. Couldn't tell exactly where we was heading because all our instruments had been smashed, but we figured it was southeast. That wasn't good. On nothing but bare poles, our little boat was running out to sea, bouncing through the chop. Nothing we could do about it. We tried to fix things up, straighten the cabin out, things like that. Mostly, though, we bailed. Except for Smitty, he was trying to fix the radio, which had clunked out from our sending distress signals so much. We kept asking him, how you doing? She won't go. Yeah, why not? The generator won't work. Why not? We can't get it started. Why not? She won't go. Smitty kept on tinkering with hours went by. And then around noon, the lookout let out a yell and pounded on the companionway hatch. We tore up to the deck. There! Hey, over there! There it is! Hey! And sure enough, a ship about four miles off. We stood there watching as it came near. We thought it was a PC boat at first, That but... ain't no PC. It's a destroyer, a limey destroyer. It won't stop. We stood there watching as it pulled alongside. We could see the men on the deck looking us over. One of them. What's he say? Hello, he says. Us stranded in the middle of the ocean, and he says hello. Take it easy, Smitty. They're going to pick us up. Joe was right. The destroyer swung around and closed to us on our starboard side. The seas were still running heavy, so the destroyer pumps bunker oil on the water to smooth it so a tow line could be floated down to us. We got the tow line all right, and with it came big black globs of thick oil, which washed up over the taff rail and covered us in the yawl like a coat of slimy glue. But we didn't care. We were so happy to be in tow, we didn't even care where they was towing us to. Say... Say, maybe she's going to going to Scotland, Smitty. I bet she's going to Scotland. Yeah? Sure, pretty ship ain't it. I bet she's going to meet up with a convoy and take us to Scotland. Well, that's okay. And so we slammed through the water in the wake of the Limey Destroyer. A heavy fog came up so we couldn't hardly see the Limey that was towing us. And the sea would spank against the bar like the water was cement. We didn't care. We was happy guys, real happy. Until about midnight that night. What's happened, Joe? Why are we slowing down? It's the tow line. What's the matter with it? It broke. We quick put on our spreader lights and shut off some red flares. And we yelled at the destroyer. We kept on yelling for a while, but it wasn't no use. She didn't hear us. And pretty soon she disappeared into the mist and we couldn't see her no more. There goes Scotland. And she didn't even know she lost us. I met a Scotchman once. He wasn't stingy at all. I remember thinking it funny at the time, because in a joke, a uh, Scotchman's got to be stingy. But not this guy. I, I remember distinctly he didn't have no hair. And he wasn't stingy. She don't even know she lost us. Log of Commander Eastern Sea Frontier. Entry December 6th. At 1300, British destroyer Caldwell reports CGR 3070 found. Orders dispatched Army Navy bases call off search. Missing yawl located at 1900. Further message from destroyer Caldwell. Message. Have lost 3070. Am searching. Request aid. End of message. Orders given for reissuance of search plans for planes and surface craft. Army and Navy bases contacted. Hunt for CGR 3070 again. Come on, baby, talk to me. 
You can do it. Just try. All I want's a few words, only a few little words. Come on, baby, talk to me, talk to me. Joe started again trying to make the radio work while the rest of us nailed tin cans over most of the holes in the 3070 so so we didn't have to bail so much anymore. See, after the Lamy Destroyer lost us, we decided we had to do something ourselves. We figured we could rig our forestaysel to the mainmast like a storm trysel, except it was torn and full of holes and we had to sew it first. So those guys who wasn't topside on watch sat around the cabin sewing. Meanwhile, Smitty and George figured out a way to strain the salt water from out the gasoline in the generator. And that way they were sure they could get the, the radio phone working. It was uh, December 9th, I think it was, six days after we'd been socked by the storm. And Smitty was fooling around with the radio like he always did, cussing a bit and talking to it like it was alive. Come on, come on, the words. Out with the words. I can't say them if you don't try. Hello, baby. Hello, baby, some more now. Try a little harder, try a little harder. Come on, come on. You ain't trying. That's it, stuff. That's the radio. A little more. Come on. Come on, baby, work at it. Come on. Calling CGR 3070. 3070. 3070. It's talking to me. Yeah. Keep it up. Nan Mike Yoke calling CGR 3070. Message for 3070. Go on, Smitty. Go on. Talk back. Answer it. CGR 3070 here. Go ahead, Nan Mike Yoke. Go ahead. I say again. I repeat. All stations east coast will keep silent and listen for you to make a report at 2200 tonight. If possible, make a report at 2200 tonight. Nan Mike Yoke of. worked. All afternoon we worked getting ready for our radio program that night. We was nervous. See, even the skipper was kind of nervous. And he said Smitty should be allowed to do the talking because he'd fix the radio. As the hour came close, we got more and more keyed up. Smitty kept fumbling with the radio and clearing his throat, kind of. And then Joe gave the word. Okay, Smitty, start talking. All right. Come on, baby. You gotta do it now. It's not working. Give it a chance to warm up, will you? Give it a chance. Come on. Had a girl. It's going to work. It's going to work. Calling CGR 3070. Nan Mike Yoke calling 3070. Come in, please. Come in. Go on, Smitty. <clears throat> CGR 3070 here. Exact whereabouts, we don't know. But we think we're 400 miles offshore. Latitude equal to about Atlantic City. Seas heavy, weather real unfavorable. Request aid, over to you. Report from you. I say again, all stations standing by to pick up report from you. This is Nan Mike Yoke calling CGR. Listen, Nan Mike Yoke, this is 3070. We're here, about 400 miles offshore. Latitude about even with Atlantic City. Request help, over to you. Call him again, Smitty, call him again. Nan Mike Yoke. 3070 calling Nan Mike Yoke. Come in, please. Come in. Over. Listen, Nan Mike Yoke. Come in, will you? Come in. Come no, in. you, Smitty. It's dead. I know. I know. Position unknown. Seas running heavy. Weather unfavorable. Request you find us. I say again. Cut it out, Smitty. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, sure, Joe. Sure. I guess I knew it wouldn't work. I guess I knew. And the radio never worked again after that night. kind of bad after the business about the radio. Kind of took the heart out of us. And we was getting pretty weak, running low on food and water, but we didn't seem to care much. We even stopped counting the days. We didn't give up hoping or anything like that, but the heart was out of us. And then one morning, we saw a ship. And then two ships. A convoy, bearing down on us. A convoy. It 
wasn't their fault they couldn't help us. They tried. The leading destroyer swung around behind us and, and tried to tag us with a tow line, but they couldn't. So they chased us through, through waves as big as mountains. They chased us on a zigzag course through the entire convoy. The 3070 zipping along, dancing in and out around the merchant ships with a destroyer like a big old sheepdog lumbering after. We could see guys lying in the rails of the merchant ships, staring, goggle-eyed. Must have looked pretty funny popping in and out like that. They didn't laugh, though. Nobody laughed. I guess they knew our little boat couldn't help itself. They knew we was being whipped by the wind. After a while, the destroyer stopped trying to catch us. And so we stood there, hanging on the rail, and we watched the destroyer and the convoy go away. We stood there, and we cried like we was babies. It was then that Joe made his speech. It wasn't much for speeches, Joe wasn't, especially now when he was still weak and sick from that crack on the head, but... Look, you guys, we lost. Maybe some of you think we won't get back. Okay. Okay. But I don't believe it. We didn't come into this outfit because we expected it to be a picnic. And it hasn't been a picnic either. We've proved to everyone we could go out on a small craft in all kinds of weather. We proved we could keep station, fulfill our assignments, and handle our ships. They said we weren't any good. A bunch of cripples not good enough to be taken into the regular army and navy. Hooligans Navy, that's us. And now we're lost. We're in bad trouble. Okay. Okay. All I want to say is, I'll bet a hundred dollars to one that our boat shows up in some harbor somewhere within the next ten days. Does anyone want to bet? Two days later, we was rescued. Yeah, we came in on our little piece of torn sail until we landed just off the coast of North Carolina where a patrol boat found us and towed us the rest of the way in. And when we got to the dock, we walked ashore. All of us. Nobody asked for help. We walked. And, well, that's about all there was to it. The Navy got us all fixed up, and they're fixing the 3070 now, and we're... Pretty soon we'll be back on the job patrolling again. You got another butt? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. That yeah, was the second worst thing about the whole business. We'll run out of butts early. Yeah. Thanks. That was tough, all right, but worst of all, we felt kind of like we'd failed somehow. All of us on the 3070 felt bad about it, real bad. What do you mean you failed? Well, you see, the whole time we was out there, we never sighted one German submarine. It's like you guys said, we didn't meet no trouble... No action. You got a match? Oh, yeah. As the 43rd program of Words at War, we've brought you a dramatization based on the book The Navy Hunts the CGR 3070, by Lieutenant Lawrence Thompson. The book was adapted for radio by Edith Summer of the NBC script staff. Heard in the role of narrator was Lamont Johnson. Others in the cast were Walter Vaughn, Walter Burke, Jackson Beck, Michael Brown, and Michael Everett. The music was by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. <laughs> Next week, another in the series of Words at War. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC Network.